Thank you, Yota. Yeah, we can hear you, you and we see. You but can see me. Yeah. Uh, full screen. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So first, let me thank Yota and Nicholas uh, for. Uh, <laughs> I should say the honor, of course, during the first talk here, but um, actually, it's really amazing uh, the tremendous interest from all the participants that have joined in for this masterclass. Um, and I think what I'm particularly pleased by is the fact that we started with this collaborative sharing network called Enlight 20 years ago, and how far we have come in particle therapy in the last 20 years. And so, but uh, uh, before I start my actual cancer and particle therapy overview, uh, Yota asked me to share this animation of a Hadron Therapy Center, which is one of the things we did as part of the Enlight network. And it's not one particular center, it's all the centers together. So there are bits and pieces from Knau, from Medostron, from HIT, and uh, in Japan, because the whole idea was to really give some live coverage. Let's see if, we, if I can get it going. So, um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. Okay, so I hear that the volume or the sound on the animation is not heard by people. So I will just do my slides first and then perhaps we can show the video afterwards if that's okay, Yota. Uh, yes, it's fine and we can show it with the volume, not to worry. Okay, so I don't yeah. know why it's not showing. Anyway, so, um, le so let's go back <laughs> to, uh, so, why are we even talking about cancer treatment, radiation therapy, uh, the challenges we are facing globally? And one of the reasons is, is cancer is really a growing global challenge. And in 2018, 18 million new cancer cases diagnosed and 9.6 million deaths. And this is increasing to 27.5 million and 16.3 million deaths by 2040. And unfortunately, 70% of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries. And I want to emphasize that also because we, are, we have people from all around the world listening in and the challenges of technology and making it available for all patients is one of our missions and passions, of course. So, and radiation therapy is a key tool for about half of the patients, even more depending on where you are. So this is our starting challenge. And then the second thing I wanted to point out is, of course, we are going to discuss particle therapy today, hadron therapy, and there are around 200 facilities globally, increasing, but around 200. And the standard X-ray Linux is over 10,000. And the reason I put this map up is to show the fact that we want to have cutting edge, state-of-the-art cancer treatment for all patients. But this is the status here. And then the orange dots are where people are still using cobalt machines as well. So one of the, the aims of everything you hear and having the young people involved to look at challenges together and how to work on common solutions so the best possible treatment is available for all. Let's change it all to blue or green or whatever your favorite color is, okay? So cancer treatment and improving outcomes. So one of the challenges is that the earlier the diagnosis, the better is the outcome. And if you can do local control, that means you treat the tumor, but you don't damage the healthy tissues, few side effects, of course, that's where you want to be. And, and so I, ideally what one needs to do is treat the tumor, whole tumor, but nothing but the tumor. But in order to do that, you need to actually see where the tumor is and then to be able to deliver dose very precisely. So all of the things you are going to be hearing this week and in terms of hit plus and all the things we're doing is really focused in early diagnosis, really good imaging, really precise treatment, and then to be able to follow up. So this is really where we are going. And I know that I'm going to give you overview of particle therapy, but Particle therapy is part of radiation therapy. And I need to give you a little bit of where radiation therapy is coming from and what the special advantages are as we go from electrons, X-rays, all the way to protons and carbon. So as I said, you can't treat if you don't know where the tumor is. 
And so particle detection in physics and Sandro mentioned already the connections between particle physics, biology, computing, radiation therapy, medical physics, all of this. So the particle detectors, which are used for detecting the Higgs boson and other particles have resulted in lots of imaging technologies, X-ray, CT, PET, MRI. I mean, it's the art of seeing. And, and what I wanted to also point out is X-ray imaging, the very first image that you most of you are familiar with in 1895, it was the first time one could look inside the body without opening it up. So really that was the revolution step. It's, and it was also the first Nobel Prize in physics. But this X-ray imaging now is being delivered as what is called computer tomography, CT. And there's lots of X-rays all around the body to be able to do 3D imaging inside the body. And this is one of the tools that is being used for diagnosing cancer globally, if you are lucky enough, of course, to have a CT and a diagnostic team, CT machine. So not only do we need really wonderful uh, accelerators and particle therapy delivery, but we also need really, really, really accurate imaging devices, but which are also available and affordable and easily usable globally. So, so once you know where the tumor is, your treatment options, Surgery, radiation therapy, it can be, you know, brachy, x-ray, hadron, whichever type you want, chemotherapy, including immunotherapy, cell therapy, and so on. But all of these, whatever you use, the aim, not, of course, survival, but besides survival, quality of life. Quality of life meaning doing very or minimal damage to healthy tissues. And this is where when we talk about hadron therapy, heavy, heavy ion therapy, particle therapy, this is what we are trying to do, is really target and protect the healthy tissues. And so, of course, today and this week, we are mostly focusing on this aspect. I will <clears throat> do a little bit of x-rays, but you will hear more from other speakers. And then, of course, particles, but there will be a lot of emphasis also on heavy ions, but all of this is what we are concentrating on today. So radiotherapy in the 21st century, the three C's of radiation therapy, cure, about 50% of the cancers are cured using radiation therapy alone or in combination with other treatments. Conservative, so except for if you do intraoperative or you do brachytherapy, most of the stuff is delivered from outside. There are fewer side effects. And, you know, and the, the idea is, of course, to, to destroy the tumor. And it's reasonably cheap compared to some of the other method, methodology. And as I said, about 50% of the patients are treated with radiation therapy, no substitute at the moment of doing something else which would be cheaper, more specific, more directed. And you saw from my very first slide, the number of patients is increasing. And one of the reasons why the number of patients is increasing is we are living longer and cancer is a multi-step process. So the longer you live, the more, unfortunately, the more likely it is that you will have enough mutations which will then result in cancer, onset of cancer. And of course, we are getting much better at diagnostics and being able to see when a person has cancer. And, and there are lots of other things which we could discuss maybe later tonight or something like this. Um, so, you know, chemicals, stress, environment, all sorts of stuff. So now let's look at, if you're talking about aims of radiotherapy, what do we have as our tools for being able to deliver radiation therapy? So we have electrons, which have a peak of energy deposition about one or two centimeters. We have X-rays or photons, which have a slightly deeper penetration and then go further into the body. And then protons, carbon ions, hadrons, with this Bragg peak, which we will be looking at later in more detail. So, so radiation therapy today, I mean, the key therapy delivery systems are cobalt machines. There are still quite a lot globally. Linear accelerators, which is the most widely used treatment, over 10,000 Linux globally. Brachytherapy, so being able to actually embed uh, uh, the radioactive source in the tissue. Image-guided radiation therapy and the latest MRI guided, I won't go into a lot of this, but you will hear this from a number of other people because I just want to give you a global perspective. 
particle therapy, we will spend lots of time. And then, you know, there is a new emerging field. There's a lot of interest in this called flash therapy. And it, when I think of flash, it makes me think of flash Gordon. So something happening really quickly and see what happens. So we'll have a little look at that as well. And so the classical radiation therapy using x-rays, I mean, you know, you can do a single beam and you can, you want to deposit all your dose in the tumor because that's the point and try to protect everything from before and after. And this is all the aims are about accurate delivery. So then you can deliver, I mean, if you just do one and you want to put 100% of the dose here to kill this tumor, if you put 100%, this is going to be much more than 100%, so everything in the path would be killed. So then you'd look at different strategies of how do you make 100 here and reduce surrounding areas. So there's been a lot of research in this field. And in the last 30, 40 years, we've gone from where we treated the tumor as a brick because we actually, our, our imaging was not good enough. Our delivery system was not good enough. And to what now we call the current state of RT, intensely modulated radiation therapy, multi-fields, planar intensity, really trying to target where the tumor is. And so, we now are able to deliver non-uniform fields, trying to really shape conformal radiation therapy around the tumor. And, you know, it's delivered in a number of fractions. And the fractions are because if you could deliver in one fraction and we could only put it exactly where it was, we would need to do fractions, but we are not able to do that at the moment, okay? And so this is a way of killing the tumor, but allowing healthy tissues to repair. So this is the current strategy in a majority of the radiation treatment. Now, so as I said, there have been many advances in radiation therapy and a lot of due to detectors, treatment planning, imaging, delivery. So, so here we are. So we've done an awful lot of uh, advances and this is the MRI guided LINAC. I'm sure somebody will discuss this at some point. And of course, is hadron particle is hadron or particle therapy the future? By the way, this hadron and particle therapy is always confounding because clinical people don't really like to call it hadron therapy, and the physicists don't like to call it particle therapy because of electrons and photons and all of those are particles too. So it's it's, it's a, a sociological challenge as well as a scientific challenge. So the idea of using hadrons or particles goes back as far as 1946 when Robert Wilson, the first director of Fermilab in just outside Chicago said, protons can be used clinically. We have accelerators because Lawrence had already developed the cyclotron. You could deliver maximum dose where the tumor is and particle therapy provides sparing of normal tissues, which is exactly what we are looking for. So if you see, I, I showed this earlier. So we are talking now these things. So protons, carbon ions, deposit their energy at the end of the range, the so-called Bragg peak, and you can situate the Bragg peak wherever you want by varying the energy. So this obviously makes a lot of sense. And so you may wonder if this was done in 1946, why are we in 2021 discussing this? Well, the simple reason is because protons are 2000 times bigger than electrons. And when things are big, they require higher energy, more powerful machines, its Bragg peak is very um, specific, but it's a Damocles sword. So you, you could deliver it, but you have to know exactly where you are delivering and it has to be de delivered precisely because you can't afford to miss the target. So there's lots of technology is needed as well as knowledge about radiobiology, about imaging and of course, clinical trials, et cetera, okay? So, and in that time we were saying, so if we could have this, so tumors which are near critical regions, so where you, for example, the optic nerve, uh, brain tumors where you don't want to have all the tissues being touched at all, tumors in children, pediatrics, where they, you know, are still growing, their tissue margins are smaller, et cetera. And then tumors which are radio resistant to the standard radiation therapy. And once again, you will hear a lot more, but I just want to give you a global perspective. So this, this I've, you know, I've, by the way, throughout these slides is part of the Enlight network. And I have liberally used and uh, stolen, if you like, from my collaborators, just to say, um, that, you know, it's, it's a collaboration. So when we see the animation, you will see that we also took parts and pieces 
from all the collaborators to put these things together. So it's visually, it's the idea is if you have a lung tumor here, you put x-ray, it goes all the way through. If you do particles, it, it stops. And I'm not going to spend too much time. The only reason I put it there is that in the afternoons when you do your treatment planning, this is exactly what you will be looking at, comparing x-rays with carbons and protons and make plans like this so that you see that they are not just exercises, they're actually used in clinical settings. So I think that the courses, that hands-on courses being um, given this week are really wonderful access to being able to do this for all of you. So as I said, so the cyclotron was invented by Lawrence in Berkeley in 1932. Wilson had already predicted the idea that you should be able to use the uh, treatment. And then in 1954, the very first patient was treated in Berkeley by Lawrence and Lawrence and their team. One brother was an accelerator physicist, other was a clinician and a collaborative team. And interestingly, since these projects are also being strongly supported by CERN, as you've heard in the physics community, 1954 is when CERN was founded. So actually we have a common history and common root. But so even though this was that long ago, it took a long time before the idea came into a clinical setting. And there were three years that made the difference. So in 1992 to 94 is really, we had some key milestone which helped. So in Loma Linda, Southern California, the first proton patient in the clinical setting, Mass General Hospital in Boston orders the first commercial proton center. In 93, you will hear, uh, of course, talks from GSI, which started the carbon iron pilot project and Haimak Chiba in Japan, the first carbon patient. So and just to put some photos to the, so the first hospital, uh, Haimak in Chiba, the pioneer in trying to treat carbon treatment, and then this amazing Darmstadt GSI pilot project, which with Gerhard Kraft, Jürgen Debus, and where they treated 450 patients with carbon ions at GSI. And here you also see something really pretty amazing. And that is an in-beam PET as the carbon beam was being delivered. And it was the first time that you could actually detect what you delivered. So this online PET. Um, and so that's it. So these three years went from labs to the clinic. And, and the result at GSI were really impressive. And this is then what led to the first clinical dual iron facility in Heidelberg. And this is, if you look at dose control, so this is conventional x-rays, protons and carbon. And you can see the control of almost 100%, over 90% with carbon ions. And these results, this is with Cordoma, these results, um, are what led to the high hit facility. And, and from a radiobiological chemical point of view, you can see why it would make sense. So this is the X-ray energy looking at the damage in DNA with X-rays, with protons, with carbon ions. And you can see as you go up, the damage is much more. So of course, if you can very much target it, then you get better killing and therefore better outcomes, of course. And so this is the uh, hit uh, Heidelberg Iron Therapy Facility. And, and this is the first facility to have had a carbon gantry. It's huge, but now you will hear about newer developments to try to also make it more compact. But Heidelberg started treating patients in 2009. It's the first dual iron clinical facility in the world. And then also when we talk about all this research, to going from research into clinical settings, it can take quite some time, particularly if the technologies are complicated, they are specialized, they need a lot of expertise, you need multidisciplinary collaborations. And so if you think, look at this, so the very first patient in 1954, and, and you see that 
until 1990, till we had Loma Linda, everything was, was being done in hospital. It was being done in research, high energy physics research laboratories. And from then on, when we went to the clinical setting, you see that there is then a big increase in patients and facilities. And, and I, I just wanted to also just put this in because you know you talk about time frames. So I think we you will see a lot more of this, but just from first proposal to a first clinical facility dedicated, I mean, it's almost 50 years, okay? So, so I think that now we need to start thinking about how do we make these advances um, faster and more available uh, for everybody? And then the involvement of CERN, CERN of course is a high energy physics laboratory. Our mandate is not to do medical applications. However, in 96, uh, Ugo Maldi, one of the strong pioneers, uh, the father of really pushing this, and um, he ha also happens to be the son of the first Secretary General of CERN. He, together with Meinhard Regler from Austria and the Czech Republic, asked CERN, could CERN do a, a proton ion medical machine study, a green field study where you know the price, the complexity, all of this, but what would be the perfect machine to do this? And so this was the PIMS pilot study. You can find it on the CERN document server. It's totally openly available as to how best to do, be able to deliver all of this. And this was then adapted by the Knau team and uh, Sandro, you heard from um, right at the beginning, uh, he's uh, the big boss at Knau now. And they started treating patients in 2011. And when I look at this wonderful, nice facility and I see something which we have called Lear at CERN, you can see the difference between a clinical facility and a hospital facility. I don't want to show you a photograph of what Lear looks at CERN. You can see it's a lab based uh, place. And then this is Medostron, Vienna Neustadt in Austria, and they started treating patients in December 2016. And you will hear more from Marburg, MIT, from their speakers later as well. And so in 2020, uh, this is last year, I have not updated this yet, is to see where, how far we have come in terms of centers. And the blue ones are the dual ion therapy centers and the others are the proton centers. And this region where there's nothing, you will hear more about that later as well. And, and here is a, a global map of where the facilities are. And you can see there are lots of gaps, of course, in particle therapy, a lot more to be done if we want this to be one of the tools readily available to all the major hospitals. And so we are talking about particle therapy facilities, Patients, yes, we are getting now quite some um, momentum, shall we say. And, and so multi-ion clinical facilities in the world, I've stolen this from uh, Sandro, and, and you, know, you can see where the, a lot of the facilities are globally, but of course we would like many more, and it would be great also to have a few in the US as well. And so, this is wanted to give you a sort of a view of where we are, but let's look at new developments. So one of the big exciting things that's happening at the moment is flash therapy, but it can happen with all particles. So flash therapy is an experimental modality, which is delivering large dose in a very short time. And remember I said that we are delivering lots and lots of fractions because we want to protect healthy tissues. We want to direct our dose to tumors. And this, this flash, it seems to be seems to be, huh? it's a big <laughs> uh, thing to prove, is that if you put a large dose in a very short time, it selectively kills tumor cells and protects healthy tissues. And if that was to be really proven solidly with many experiments, many clinical trials, that would make treatment more readily available, more patient throughput, better outcome. So this is why, of course, there's a huge interest. So there was a treatment of the very first patient with electron flash radiation therapy in Chauve in Lausanne near Geneva. Um, and I'm not going to go all these details because I know that there are other people speaking after me. Uh, then there is the Varian Flash Forward Consortium, which again, the other one was using electrons and photons. This one is using protons. And 
it's a feasible, and they've just started their first flash clinical trial um, for treatment of symptomatic METs. It's called FAST01, and it's delivering eight gray in short times. But as I said, you can look this up, and then there's already a follow up trial that's being prepared. And of course, IBA, which also is uh, delivering uh, lar the largest number of proton machines, has also uh, delivered a successful radiation dose using flash as well. So what I want to say is there is a huge interest in this. So of course, we want to look at carbon as well. So dose rate, significant impact, shows that normal tissues can be protected. It seems to be oxygen dependent. There are further studies ongoing much to be done, but something really exciting to be followed. And then there is this paper by Marco Durante and his collaborators, the idea of using particle therapy for inducing the immune response of the cells. So can we actually try to use this in uh, making particle therapy more effective? Uh, here is a non-oncological application coming from CNAO, and it's really non-invasive proto-radiotherapy for a tachycardia. So, you know, it's non-oncological, but it's interesting that one can start thinking about particle therapy for a number of different points. Uh, so, you know, but much remains to be done. And this is why we are uh, discussing because we want everybody to be aware of what's going on. We need new talented people also to get involved, new ideas, creative to move the field in a way. So there are many challenges. So we need the machines, the synchrotrons, the synchrocyclotrons, Linux, whatever. We want them smaller, simpler, cheaper. Uh, the gantry, I told you about, this is the first gantry at Heidelberg, 600 tons. Again, we want them compact, cheaper, energy efficient. I say this because I know you will hear a lot about all of this uh, during the week. Um, precision is everything. So Bragg Peak is very precise. So the idea of being able to measure and deliver and monitor is as important as uh, the actual treatment itself. Uh, there is the challenge of the fact that, you know, uh, as I already said, the Bragg Peak is very specific, but then you have moving organs, you have how to track, uh, for example, if there's a tumor in the lung, motion, all of these things to be uh, taken care of. Um, and then, Clinical trials, we have some clinical trials, but we need a lot of um, more data on protons, carbon ions, multicentric trials. So much, much more, more to be done. And then, and I want to just finish up with finally the fact that is, you know, we want all of this. We want it to be affordable. We want it to be cheap. We want to increase the number of treated patients per year. So, and this, and this is what this week also will emphasize is what the current view is, but what the future is, how to explore new ideas. And then, and I think something like this, it needs, I already said that the very first patient being treated by Lawrence and Lawrence and their team, accelerator physicists, medical doctor, is that it needs a multidisciplinary collaboration. We need to be able to work together with the idea of the patient in the middle and for a global outlook. So I'm going to discuss a little bit of this about six at 6 p.m. today. And, and the idea that how can we leverage what we already know to help areas where there is this technology lacking and this one is a map of Europe. And here we see the Southeastern European region where this hardly, well, there's nothing. So there is the, 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 why is there a need for the Southeast European Institute, which can do this for innovative cutting edge research. And you will hear uh, Mimosa Aristova's talk, which follows mine to be able to see the logic of this. And then I really want to um, thank the Enlightened community and the collaborators whose slides and research I have used for this presentation. And this is a photograph of where I used to be before I came to CERN, and that's the Bevelac in Berkeley, where the first patient was treated in 1954. And I was going to say um, um, uh, to Yotab, could we perhaps try to show the video now? Would that be possible? Yes, 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 of okay. course, man. Thank you. Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you very much, sir.
you went uh, very fast, so we have plenty of time to show yes, okay. the video. Yeah. And I wanted uh, have... I wanted to have time for questions. For questions, yes, we have collected yeah. some okay. questions. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Medical doctors are always on the lookout for new weapons against cancer. Medical doctors are always on the lookout for new weapons against it. I have cancer, and I'm being treated with hadron therapy, which is one of the latest types of treatment. The beams you see are protons and other ions, which are precisely aimed at the tumour. They are so precise, they do not damage the healthy tissue around the tumour. Producing these iron beams and targeting the tumour requires a dedicated centre. The treatment process starts from the accelerator complex. This is housed in the basement of the clinical center and it is where the therapeutic iron beams come from. Hadron therapy accelerators may be as large as a tennis court, depending on which ions they produce. The accelerator is managed from a nearby control room. Here, beam parameters are set up and constantly monitored according to each treatment plan. The ions are initially generated and fed into a linear accelerator, then into a circular accelerator, and then steered by magnets along the beamline to reach the treatment rooms. Finally, ions go through a rotating structure, which is called a gantry, to target the tumour from different angles. The most advanced treatment rooms also accommodate imaging devices providing detailed information on size and location of the tumour right before the irradiation. While small gantries work well to steer protons around the patient, a massive structure is required for carbon and other ions. Before each treatment session, I'm precisely positioned on a couch in the preparation room and then I go through an imaging device. This can take quite some time, but it's a crucial step to ensure that, for each daily session, my doctor knows exactly where the tumour is. Special areas to prepare children for treatment might also be available. The most advanced centres also host a research and development area to improve hadron therapy techniques and tools. There are also meeting and presentation rooms, staff offices, a cafeteria and the reception. Doctors, physicists, engineers and biologists are all working to make this technique cheaper and more effective so that other patients can benefit too. For my specific type of cancer, hadron therapy was the best option and I was lucky to have access to this type of treatment centre. Okay, great. This gives a good idea. Uh, there are some questions for you, Manjit, that are collected through the document. Uh, let me start with one. Uh, there is, uh, it is related to the flash uh, therapy. It is uh, surprising uh, that a uh, huge amount of energy uh, protects the healthy tissues. How is this explained? Well, that's a million dollar question right uh, so the mechanisms are being looked at as to how this is happening it looks like is to do with the oxygen levels and the oxygen levels within the tumor tissue versus the healthy tissue um, but uh, at the moment you know uh, that's yeah that's I don't want to make any predictions but it is clearly is linked to oxygen levels but uh, I think that we need to wait for more results to be able to say something definitive but it really is sort of looks a little bit like magic, if you see what I mean. Yeah, actually, the next question was related to exactly what is the role of the oxygen? <laughs> <laughs> it's to do with the, the sensitivity. So you can uh, answer this question, you can say a few words. On <laughs> so no, no, but it just basically is to do with the sensitivity of the cells with the oxygen levels and how radiation interact with it and I mentioned in my talk earlier for example that you know um, some tumors are radio sensitive and um, and therefore you know you need something like 
because they don't have enough oxygen there. And this is why carbon and higher particles, which would be more effective against radio sensitive tumors, because you don't need the presence of oxygen for the radiation to be effective. So it's clear that uh, the presence of oxygen is necessary in terms of cell killing. Okay, so I think this is one of the things we've known and that's why uh, tumor cells tend to be more sensitive to radiation than normal cells. But I think the exact mechanism, I don't want to put my hand on fire at the moment. Okay, thank you, Manzita. Uh, Arish, please go ahead and start yes. reading the question from by one. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Manzit. Very nice presentation. So we have uh, some uh, extra questions of gathered in our Google form. Uh, so the first one is, how powerful are various types of radiation treatment against radio-resistant humors? <laughs> so, okay, so that's precisely the sort of thing I was saying is that, you know, so x-rays is considered, you know, when we are looking at radiobiological effects in the old days when we were doing radiobiology, we would say the x-ray has a radiobiological effect of one because that's just a parameter. And then you look at proton, it's more or less one, maybe 1.1. But it depends exactly, you know, precisely where you measure on the on the Bragg peak, because we always thought it was the same. But research recently has shown that the distal edges, you know, the edge of the thing, the radiobiological effect is a bit more. So one has to be very careful how one positions the Bragg peak. And when you go to something like carbon, uh, it's about three times more radiobiological effect. About okay, because you have to be uh, much more accurate in this. And, and the, the theory, of course, is the, the, the bigger the particle, the more is the radiobiological effect because it carries, uh, you know, bigger hammer, if you like. So that's what we, some of the research is being looked at is that when tumors are radio resistant to standard radiation therapy like x-rays and protons don't have enough energy, we can go to something like carbon which damages the DNA directly without needing oxygen. And uh, so you can overcome radio resistance. But you know, the research that has been going on in Heidelberg and DKFZ and GSI shows that you know, not perhaps carbon can't do all of this. We should also look at oxygen. We have to look at other things, but that is the idea of using things like carbon and oxygen treatment is to overcome this radio resistance. Okay, thank you very much. I think you have answered the fully the question. Uh, next one is, uh, is carbon ion therapy sufficient by itself or should it be combined with other type of therapy treatment methods? <laughs> um, maybe actually, I know that we have a number of people also from uh, Heidelberg and GSI. Uh, yes, uh, it's not always enough. So there are other ways and trying to do combinations. And remember, I even mentioned the idea of using some of the particle therapy to induce uh, immune responses, but also a uh, long time ago, Anders Brahmin, who did the first prediction of IMRT, even with x-rays, he was talking about using mixed ions. So not just carbon, but also combining with others. So in the end, the strategies of radiation therapy that we look at, for which you need research, of course, you need to really prove it in vitro and then in vivo, is what are the combinations that are going to give you the best cell killing, but the best protection for healthy tissues. So we, lots of ideas are being looked at together. And there are, you know, there are talks on uh, radiobiology and uh, treatment and strategies during the week. So I'm sure that they will give you a lot more information about that. Perfect. And another question is, can we do flash radiotherapy with photons? Yes, uh, people are also looking at that. But you know, the thing is, when, the reason why we went from electrons to photons for conventional radiation therapy is because electrons did not penetrate far enough into the tissue because uh, you know, they only they stopped at a couple of centimeters. So then you made photons which go further in. So maybe, we will be looking at photons because most of the conventional radiation therapy is delivered using photons, but maybe you don't, may not even want to go there because if you could do the same thing with electrons, particularly nowadays that you can make higher energy electrons, which have, you know, because when, when I talk about one or two centimeters, we are talking something like 25 MeV, but if you increase 
the energy of the electrons to 50, 100, 150 MeV, which now you are able to do. And there is a, there is a big collaboration going on also between CERN and SHUV using click technology, which was delivering high energy electrons, but making more compact machines because we couldn't do that until this is coming to being. So you could increase the electron energy and penetrate further into the body. Okay, so you, you can still get the depth. You can focus them because electrons are charged, which photons aren't. So yes, there will be, I mean, there of course, people are looking into this, but it might make more sense to look at electrons first, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and another participant says, hello and thanks for the talk. Regarding the difference between treated patients with carbon and proton therapy, why is the difference in treatment number so big? Is it because of the different time that they're in development? Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. You mean the number of patients treated? Do you mean the number of patients treated? Uh, yeah, probably it's this one. It says regarding the difference between treated patients with carbon and proton therapy, uh, why is the difference in treatment number so big? Is it because of the different time that they are in development? Yes, yeah, oh, okay, I see, I understand. Okay, so you see the thing is, so the very first proton machine came into being, as you know, at the beginning of the 90s at Loma Linda, and now protons are available commercially from a number of companies, and there are many, many more machines for protons, so therefore more, it's becoming a more mature technology, shall we say, so more patients are being treated, there is more availability. When you talk about carbon ions, there are now 11, I think, 11, maybe 12 facilities, depending on how you count who's treating, so, uh, even though particle therapy, the whole idea started in Berkeley in the 1950s, there isn't a carbon facility in the US at the moment. In, in Europe, we have four, and you will hear from all four of them. So Heidelberg, Knau, Medostron, and Marburg. And there are quite a number of facilities in Japan and a few now coming up in China and Korea. So yes, the, the number of carbon facilities, you can count still almost in your hands and it's 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 it's, it's a more uh, complex technology because it's a bigger particle you need more powerful machines and you know it's most of them so far have been synchrotron based uh, and etc yes so this is why there are a few few machines but we are getting there and i hope that you will hear a lot more and you will certainly hear from Maurizio Bretner who will talk after Memosa about what is going on in terms of accelerated technology, what's changing, how we could make them more readily available in the future. Okay, thank you. And the, the other question is about carbon ions. Is there a particular reason why we use carbon ions? There are several ions in between proton and carbon. Why are they not being widely used? Well, that, well, that's a little bit historical, if you like. So when the Japanese were discussing with the Berkeley Research Group at that point, and also, of course, uh, with our German colleagues as well, because Gerhard Kraft and Wilma used to come and do their, some of their radiation also in the Berkeley labs, was that they, there was a discussion that besides proton, and proton was an obvious one to use because it's more or less the same radiobiological effect as X-rays, is what other iron should be used. And sort of looking at the data they had, carbon seemed to be that had sufficient biological effect without a lot of fragmentation tails to give secondary particles, you know, because if you get tailing and the, the iron fragments, you can actually get tumors or at least mutations on the tail end of the, the Bragg peak. And at that point, point, it was felt that if you had to choose one that made the most sense from the data. But of course, now there is a lot of interest to look at other ions in between. And, you know, and if one was, and probably I will be killed for this, but perhaps if I was looking at from the beginning, if helium and protons can be just as readily produced, maybe one would have gone for helium rather than proton, because it has a little bit more energy and the Bragg peak is a little bit sharper. But yeah, it was uh, the decision made on the data that was available, but now there is research and I hope that perhaps um, our uh, uh, DKFZ guys and GSI will give some of the data where they're looking at some of the other ions as well. Okay, uh, next question is why is the heavy ion therapy gantry so big? <laughs> because carbon is, uh, has a, 
well, I, I think I should let Maurizio answer this because it's, it's to do with the, the magnetic field that's needed to bend the large particles. But I think I'm not an accelerator physicist and perhaps we should get Maurizio if he's not online or at least get him to do this in his session because uh, yeah, it's just to do with the size and bending the particle, the beams. Okay. Uh, Thank you Maurizio, for giving me this, this, this question. I will answer. Yeah. Thank you, please do. Yes. Thank so you. Yeah, you will answer it in your talk, right? So that's fine. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next question is, what is the energy range of the radiations used for therapy? What? What is the energy range of the radiations used for therapy? So, so you, so, okay, so uh, normally for uh, photons, uh, uh, we are talking about anything from about 6 to 15, 25, depending on exactly what you need. For uh, protons, we are talking about... 240 MeV for carbon is around 300. Again, you will find out more of this from the radio biology in that range. Thank you. Uh, are the existed carbon and proton centers actually loaded with patients fully? Do these centers make profit? Well, I mean, in Europe, you know, we have National Health Service, right? So I'm talking about the carbon centers at the moment, okay? Um, so one of the things is actually that's really needed is, well, that's an interesting question. There are quite a lot of facilities. Are they loaded? You have to talk to the, the, the actual centers themselves, uh, but the European methodology is mostly national health center. Perhaps uh, I could get um, either Thomas Harborough or Sandra to answer these questions. In Japan, they did lots of treatment and in the US, they actually had business models for their proton centers. I think that um, we need to raise awareness to show that when protons should be used, when carbon should be used, when x-rays. So uh, I can't answer that question at the moment because you know it's very difficult that if you have a center, say I'm going to just use the example of now, and patients have to travel, and, you know, and if there's only one machine and it's Northern Italy, and then how do you, you know, it's not so easy also for patients to be able to move around. Uh, and, and, you know, they are sick. And I, I think it would, there would be many more patients treated if the radiation therapy centers were closer to where the patients were. I mean, that's just my uh, take, but perhaps Sand if Sandra's online, perhaps he can answer that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question about carbon ion therapy. Sandro, Sandro oh, yes. would like to answer the question. Can you repeat the question, please? So, so the question is, are the carbon centers loaded with patients? The, the recruitment of patients is, is effectively an issue in the sense that uh, uh, there is uh, still a lot to do in order to to, uh, to solve the problem. Uh, the problem is that, uh, the point is that this facility, as you can see, as you will see during the week, uh, are rather complicated. They, are cost, they cost a lot. And so there is the need to have uh, uh, one center that is collecting uh, patients from uh, a, a, a wide region. So this means that uh, is uh, needed to create a network uh, network that connect uh, the, the carbon center with many other institutions and hospitals. For example, CNAO is a national facility. And so we needed to collect uh, patients from all over Italy. And uh, this is not always uh, uh, easy in the sense that first of all, uh, the doctors that are uh, selecting patients regionally, they need to know adron therapy and which kind of tumors we treated now. And second point, uh, we need also to inform them properly uh, that uh, in order to, to, to convince them that we are not a competing uh, modality, we are uh, in their hands uh, another treatment modality that add to the existing modalities. When we, the patients that we treated now are really rare disease, but uh, being rare, 
the knowledge of uh, 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 hadron therapy for treating those patients uh, is a crucial message that needed to be spread all over the, the, the health system. So uh, this uh, uh, so is not only a problem to build the facility, but is also a problem to insert properly the facility in the network of the hospital and the health system. Uh, this is ongoing. After 10 years, I have to say that we made progresses, but not yet uh, at the level that I would, uh, I would uh, have expected. So we are, I would say now, at 70% of our capability, let's say. We treat routinely 500, 600 patients. Maybe we could go up to 750 patients per year. And of course, all the issue of uh, uh, patient traveling, uh, uh, patient monitoring, uh, uh, these issues also deal with the organizational aspect. So it's not an easy issue. Uh, and uh, of course, is as crucial as uh, having the possibility of installing such a facility in your country. Thank you, Sandro. Okay. Yes. Next question is, what is the point of using flash with particles slash ions when we're not using BRACPIC? <laughs> yes, well, that's an um, interesting question. Well, well, we were using the BRACPIC because we want to protect healthy tissues, right? Now, we think that with flash, we are going to come up with, we are think, huh? because this has to be a long way to go, that we might be able to protect the healthy tissues without perhaps going to really, really expensive synchrotron or cyclotron machines or you know, using protons and carbon ions and so on. Um, so, but this, this is at the moment too early to say, that's one thing. And the second thing is, uh, don't forget that unless you're going to start putting in high energy electron machines where the penetration is further in, you, if you don't use protons and carbon ions, it's still going to be difficult to be able to treat tumors which are deeply seated, right? So I think that it's too early to answer this question. One, because we don't know how effective it's going to be. And two, Nevertheless, as the current LINAC machines don't deliver high enough energy electrons to go really deep into the body. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Manjit. Uh, in fact, there are uh, many more questions. <laughs> we will keep them for uh, the afternoon sessions that we'll have discussions with uh, the moderators. And uh, you got all the cascade, uh, you have just an overview, but all these uh, topics are going to be discussed uh, throughout uh, the week. Yeah. And yeah. so now the next speakers know also yeah. what yeah. they have to do. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, <laughs> my, idea, my idea was just to give a little bit of an overview. So because there course, will be many more detailed idea. talks. That was, that was why I wanted to give lots of room for questions just to get the dialogue started. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So now we can um, continue with uh, the next uh, speaker. Mimosa Aristova, professor in uh, Serial University in uh, Skopje, will discuss about uh, cancer data statistics that she has been working uh, the last few years. Uh, Mimosa, you can uh, start uh, sharing uh, your screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Screen and we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi everybody, uh, uh, I have never spoken in front of audience uh, greater than 100 people, so this is a great opportunity, like a rock star talking in front of so many, uh, 800 and something. Um, thank you, Yota, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to give this talk, and uh, yeah, let me start. <clears throat> If I disappear for a, a moment, that means I, I need to perform my cough because I'm allergic to linden tree, which is now very active in the air. So please excuse me in advance. So uh, this picture uh, is uh, done by, uh, it, it is a 3D projection of our Institute of uh, Sustainable Technologies that is designed for the Southeastern European countries. 
to serve as a particle therapy center and uh, as a research facility, uh, research infrastructure. So this is Dimitris Caprini's uh, picture, uh, who with uh, Yota Foca designed this beautiful uh, setup, uh, being uh, put in the middle of the forest somewhere, and we don't know yet where because we are in a process of competing and preparing, um, preparing to 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 offer the countries with the political decisions need to offer the space for this, to host this facility. <clears throat> I have borrowed this picture from Manjit uh, to show, uh, to continue uh, discussing uh, what is missing in our uh, Southeastern European, uh, also known as Balkan, Balkan region. Geographically, it's a Balkan Peninsula. And we, we have uh, therapy centers uh, denoted everywhere throughout Europe, but in the gray area, we don't have them. So uh, we are not really, uh, 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 countries of the Balkans are not really country size. They are small, small, um, if you see this picture, they are small areas, part of one entire region and they are like nanoparticles. They have different behavior when they're uh, very tiny and very small. Uh, they, have, they are developing different properties from uh, the bulk as it is done, uh, it, it, as it is known in, into the material science. So uh, the sea region is, uh, contains various countries, Albania, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Greece, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Serbia, and Slovenia, which belong according to, uh, to, the, <clears throat> to the economy, economical forum, they belong to different, uh, different uh, categories 